Hey everybody, welcome to Unit 2. Unit 2 being the place that we finally get to actually start building some models of the universe and we're not just measuring things that to some people seem to be immediately obvious. So, I just wanted to start off by comparing Unit 2 to Unit 1. Unit 1 was all about measuring and quantifying the world around us. We did a really great job. We were able to measure the length of objects, we were able to find volume, figure out what their mass was and eventually start calculating density. We then moved on to looking at motion and how things moved about. We could calculate speed and then finally we were even able to figure out acceleration and how far something would have to go during acceleration. And that was all good. And But the problem is that's only sort of science. I mean we've, we've been able to measure and quantify some things that seem fairly obvious and if we just left it at there, then, well, this course wouldn't have been any more challenging than something you would have taken, like, in middle school. We applied, we simply came up with some complicated math to justify fairly standard observations. Unit 2 is where physics really begins to start. And it's where we take those measurements that we did in Unit 1, and we started converting them into things that can't directly be measured. Uh, but they allow us to figure out what's going on in the universe around us because outside of things that are like show up in quantum mechanics, these are the laws that govern everything that functionally moves and works in the universe. And so these things that I'm talking about that can't be directly measured, what I'm dealing with is energy and forces. Now, I want to quickly dispel this concept that energy and forces have some kind of a mystical nature to them. They don't. These are things that are quantifiable. We have science to back them up that they exist. We've applied a formula that has worked in every situation that we could figure out. And so these are very, very real things. And I want to quickly kind of get us away from the idea that energy and forces is something kind of that is it's movie magic. This is energy and forces are the core of what physics deals with and it's very very different than the context of what you guys are dealing with like the little picture there with Yoda shooting lightning bolts out of his hands. All right, that's not that might be the force or energy in a certain context, but that's not the context that we're dealing with. So to begin dealing with the context that we are looking at, we're going to be taking a look at forces in motion today. Um, the, our objective for this video, you guys should be able to calculate a force or the components of a force if I give you the information to do so. So, starting us off, we need to know about this guy named Isaac Newton. Now, Sir Isaac Newton is a terribly important person, not just because he looks like Hugh Jackman in a wig, but because he actually did something useful for science and as you guys are going to as we go along through this course I'm going to be criticizing some certain scientists for making really obvious observations and I, Sir Isaac Newton gets just really kind of put in this category of a guy who actually just observed the obvious congratulations apples fall from trees although I think that story is actually a myth I don't think he was sitting under a tree got hit by an apple and came up with the theory of gravity but he was the, the original guy who came up with some of the big things that we deal with in math and physics. And he was an English mathematician and physicist. And if you were to talk to a lot of famous scientists, a lot of people would say he was arguably one of the most influential scientists of all time. This guy is up there with like your Einsteins for coming up with ways to really study the universe around us. So classical mechanics, or what we call Newtonian mechanics, really borrows, he was like the guy who lays the foundations for understanding how things move and forces and energy. He also did a huge amount of work in optics, the way that we can bend and move light. And of course, the one thing that everybody knows about Sir Isaac Newton is that he was a pro at figuring out gravity from falling apples. And like I said, it's probably not true, but you can't get through Isaac talking about Isaac Newton without dealing with the whole apples thing. So moving on, he comes up with these three big laws of motion, and this is just something that every single you know middle school teacher loves to teach. You know, they bring out the the fun little toys, and you build roller coasters or skate parks or whatever to this kind of stuff, and. I'm going to assume that you guys have at least a functional background in the three laws of motion, but I do want to make sure that we go back through and make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So the first one is momentum. And momentum is kind of like law zero. It's not actually one of Newton's big three laws of motion, but you have to understand what momentum is. And momentum, 
while we can quantify it, there's a formula for momentum. The general idea is this. If a big object is moving, it will be hard to slow down. If a small object is moving, it is easy to slow down. And speed also plays a part. If a big object is moving fast, that's going to be much harder to slow down than a big object moving slowly. And anybody who's ever shot a gun knows that the opposite is true, that a small object moving very, very fast is very difficult to stop. Okay, you can't just reach out and grab a bullet out of midair. And if you did, it would do a lot of damage to you because it has a huge amount of momentum. It's moving quickly. So momentum, we're dealing with the size of the object and how fast it's moving. And we're thinking about how hard would it be to change its direction or to slow it down or speed it up. So that's just kind of the basis of, or one of the kind of big concepts that we associate with motion. And then we get into Newton's actual three laws, which are right here. And the first one is the law of inertia, that an object will continue doing whatever it is doing until something tells it to do otherwise. And it's, it's, it's really, really obvious. I'm, I'm sorry, but it, and it, has, you know, it has merit to it, and it does establish some things about motion, but it's really obvious. So a book sitting on a table will continue to sit on a table until something moves it off of the table. And that's just the way it is. Your room will not clean itself. A, a statement made by every mother ever, and congratulations, that's the law of inertia. Now, it can work the other way. A ball rolling across a frictionless surface will keep rolling across a frictionless surface until somebody stops it. So it, can't, it does involve motion. It's not only about objects sitting still, but inertia is the, the tendency of an object to keep doing whatever it is doing. The second one, Newton's second law is the one that we will focus on the most, and that is force is equal to mass times acceleration. And the bigger something is, the more force is required to accelerate it. So we are going to quickly break this one down. This is a formula I will give you later, but you have to become familiar with F equals MA. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. And so if I have a really large object, it is going to take a huge amount of force to get it to accelerate. If I want something to have a huge amount of acceleration, once again, it's going to require a large amount of force. Um, on the flip side, a large, uh, large object that is moving very, very quickly or is accelerating very quickly has a huge amount of force behind it. So understand law two, force is equal to mass times acceleration. And then law three, the fuzziest of all the laws, the laws that early sciences really, really struggle with because students at that point don't have kind of the cognitive thinking skills to worry about this one. But every action has an equal and opposite reaction. My favorite statement for this one is if I have a guy that is falling and, oh, oh look, ah, he's falling very quickly. It's not him hitting the ground that's going to kill him. It's the ground hitting him back. So when he hits the ground, he is going to apply a force into the ground. Oh wait, I just realized that's outside of the screen that you guys can see. There's the ground, you guys can see that. When he hits the ground, he is going to apply a force into the ground, and that's all good and well, except that the ground is simultaneously going to push back on him. And it's not him hitting the ground that winds up killing him. Go away. It's the ground hitting him back that kills him. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and this is something that we will, we will visit over and over again as we move through this unit. So forces. Forces in general are described as being a push or a pull that acts upon an object as a result of its interaction with another object. The really important part is I'm going to go ahead and highlight is that a force is a push or a pull. All right, it has to move something, and it has it has to cause a a little bit of acceleration for this thing to happen. And in order for something to accelerate, it has to be moving. So a force is a push or a pull. And we measure forces in newtons. Now, we've used newtons before in unit one. Newtons was our unit for weight, if you guys remember right. Newtons was the, uh, sorry, newtons was the unit for weight because weight, we factored this one as mass times gravity. Weight is equal to mass times gravity. Well, look, I have a mass, and I have gravity, remember, is an acceleration. So I have a mass times an acceleration, and so this is Newton's second law right here. Law two. F equals MA. And we can break all of these forces down into one of two things. 
Basically, all forces are either contact forces, which means that something has literally collided with something else. Um, otherwise, it's an action at a distance force, which means something is kind of drawing it closer like a magnet would. Now, I'm going to go over a couple of quick forces. Here's a list of ones, the frictional force, tension force, normal force. These all require contact or physical collisions to happen in order for these to work. The other ones are the action at a distance forces. This would be like gravity being one great example. Gravity doesn't reach out, grab you, and pull you towards the center of the Earth. That would be not only kind of disturbing and creepy, but also incredibly obvious. Gravity works in a much more mysterious way where you are, you're being drawn towards it almost like a magnet. So those are action at a distance forces. Here's a couple of quick examples. The applied force, one that you guys will have to know, that's F sub APP. Um, the applied force is literally a force that is moving something in a direction. So if you were pushing a desk across the room, you are applying a force to the desk. And that's where we get the phrase applied force. Now, it has to move in order for the applied force to happen. And the thing that opposes all motion is known as the friction force. You guys can see down here with my diagram of the lawnmower. I've got a guy who's pushing a lawnmower forward and friction force is holding it back. Now the amount of friction that we have is determined by what we're trying to go over. So you guys can see here, there's going to be a lot less friction on the guy with skis on snow versus the guy who is sitting there on a grassy hill. The grassy hill is providing so much friction that he doesn't actually go anywhere, where if he was in a similar situation on snow with skis, he would be sliding down the hill quite easily. So the surface that we have determines how much friction we're dealing with. Gravitational force, something that I have already talked about, and once again, I have the lovely apple dropping out of a tree. Thank you, Sir Isaac Newton. I don't know why that had to be such a big discovery, but thank you. And then finally, the normal force. And the normal force is the force that, or the support force. If you put something on top of a table, or if you are sitting on top of a chair, you are clearly applying a force down into that chair. Okay, gravity is trying to pull you through the chair. Now, you don't actually go through the chair because the chair applies what's called the normal force, or it's the force that resists you falling through it. And so the normal force is important anytime that we're dealing with a collision, and it basically comes from the idea of law three, which is that there's this opposite action that happens for every action.